Uh, good afternoon or morning or night, whenever it is. Uh, welcome to the class today on uh, psychology of gender. I'm Dr. Herb Agan, a legend in his own mind. Uh, <laughs> that was good. See, I worked on, all the way over here. I was going to do that. Um, oh, yes. Uh, Amy and Shauna, are you there out in Cinco? No. John, are you there in uh, North Harris County? You guys, you have to push that little button and say, hey, if you're there or not there. So I don't know if they're there. But um, wherever you are, welcome to the class. And those of you who are getting this on TV, uh, what we're going to do in every class is we're pretty much going to start and just jump into it with the studio class here. Um, rather than us chat for 10 minutes and then include you, we're going to pretty much start right on time and have fun and jump into this. Uh, those of you, y'all have y'all got the book, obviously. Do they have it here at the bookstore at the U of H? Okay, but because somebody said Rowther's bookstore also has it, I don't know. Well, anyway, so you got it. So there you go. And uh, for those uh, uh, Vang and John, if uh, you're out there uh, watching it, um, uh, we had a syllabus that I showed you the other day. You should have those syllabi uh, somewhere. And it, it shows uh, basically what we're going to study. And uh, uh, the, actually, the purpose of the syllabus is for those of you who are like a planned, orderly, decided way of life. Um, you're J on the Myers Briggs test. And uh, th that means you like, uh, you suffer from mallard linearization. You like all your duckies in a row. So I have this nifty little syllabus for you so you won't be anxious about where we're going. I am a P on the Myers-Briggs perception. Go with the flow, spontaneity. Let's see what happens. So that doesn't mean, that means we won't necessarily stick to this. So for those that are spontaneous, you'll like it. For those that are uh, mallard, linear, size, whatever, uh, you're going to freak out anyway. No, but basically this is sort of what we're going to do. The, the most important thing for you as you're looking at the syllabus here is to realize we will have an exam on June 21st. We'll do... I'll do seven lectures, I have a test, then we'll do seven more lectures, have an exam, and then five lectures with an exam. I find that over the years, students really don't care about anything that I care about. They only care about what do I have to do to get an A at one of the exams. So um, I, I totally understand that. That's important. And we'll try to accommodate that. Uh, one of the things I have told the students here, and uh, for John and uh, Vang here, who's new, um, is Kwang's uh, here and Kim's here. Um, is that you will get extra credit for doing uh, any outside work and turning it in? I like three or four strong extra credits, uh, and it just so happened yesterday I was reading. Um, I picked up the U.S. News and World Report, and there was actually an article about gender power, which I thought was kind of clever. And uh, in fact, this is kind of cute. Show this. See, the, uh, this is politically incorrect in several ways. One, we have slavery. Second, we have a cowboys and Indians, politically incorrect, tying up someone. See, this is, goes way back. But these are two guys playing cowboys and Indians. Can y'all see that? Boys will be boys. Interesting article. Let me just read this to you as a way of kind of jumping into today. It's a scenario, scenario repeated countless times on countless playgrounds. Three little girls are pretending to bake cookies, and a little boy joins in or tries to. One of the girls rebuffs him loudly. You can't do that. Only girls are allowed here. Uh, the little boy, chastened but wiser for the lesson in gender politics, retreats. This preschool scenario has real-life consequences not only for small children, but throughout childhood, even early adolescence, say Arizona State University researchers. The little girl setting the kitchen rules uh, is not merely bossy. She is playing a crucial role as a gender enforcer. A gender enforcer. <laughs> Certainly you've known some in your life. You may be one. A child who snaps into action whenever another child attempts to violate a gender boundary. This is something to be aware of over the weekend, and y'all might be thinking, 
where are the gender enforcers and meet the gender enforcer within. Uh, and everyone, not just the violator, but also the other girls making mud cookies, get the message. As it turns out, enforcers are merely providing backup for a job that most children are already doing, doing fairly effectively um, for themselves. As developmental scientists uh, Carolyn Lynn Martin and Richard Fabes describe in their current issue of developmental psychology, even very young kids tend to isolate themselves by sex when they play, and the more they do, the more repellent they find the opposite sex <clears throat> as time goes on. After close, closely observing the play of 61 preschoolers and kindergartners for a year, researchers found the stereotypical gender behavior was dosage dependent. That is, children who spent more time with the same sex peers in the fall demonstrated more gender typical behavior in the spring. In other words, you hang around your group and later you end up being like the group. Uh, and as the boys and girls become more isolated from each other because of their behavior, the less they want to challenge stereotypes. That would be the old pink and blue thing, you know. Uh, you know, once you're into your blueness as a guy, you pretty much don't even want to challenge the pinkness of the, of the girls. Um, the early dosage of gender stereotyping uh, spirals to the point that girls and boys become less likely to interact with one another. Marta notes that she conducted her study in a school committed to gen gender equality. <clears throat> but deep-seated attitudes apparently trump official policy. That is a, that's probably the deep... Uh, that's probably the mantra of this course, is that deep-seated attitudes tend to trump um, policy, official policy. I have been studying gender for a long time, Martin says. I thought we would see sex segregation that others have reported. What I didn't think was that it would be as strong as it was. Given the intensity of our choices when we are four years old, the real mystery is how the sexes manage to get together at all. <laughs> you probably can remember some of you in your early uh, religious classes and, you know, when boys had cooties, girls had cooties, and they'd, they'd separate the sexes, pinks and blues, and, you know, get on the bus and all the guys over here. And, and you know, teachers would often do that to stamp out the amorous teenagers, particularly when they're moving up in their junior high days. But often when they're young, you know, ki kids at... Uh, well, here they're talking four years old are already dividing themselves among uh, their sexes. Why do you think that is? What do you think is going on with the kids? Have they already learned it? Family? You think family's already decided a lot of that? Why do you think they're grouping themselves? <clears throat> Might it just be basic insecurity? Wanting to be with the same kind? Uh, might it be... Uh, well, it could be a lot of factors. Uh, Interesting. Hey, uh, John, are you here? John, out there in uh, North Harris County? Push the little button and say hello. Hello. Hey, John. Yay. Uh, good to have you. We missed you yesterday. You, you got a letter grade deducted because you didn't come the first day. I was here. Oh, I was here. A likely story. They couldn't turn on the television set. That was the problem, right? Uh, well, it was on. I saw you. I guess uh, you didn't hear me. Oh, I can't wow. see you today, but I'm listening to you. Yeah, I can see you. Can you see me? Uh, no, sir, I, I, I cannot. They're uh, trying to reboot this computer here in a few minutes, I guess. Oh, so you can't see me? So, so I can look at you like this. And uh, uh, Anyway, okay. Well, welcome, John. Did you get the syllabus? Uh, yes, sir, I did. I, and I got a tape of the first uh, lecture as well. Appreciate that. Well, there you go the efficiency of the Houston media services. Well, welcome, and uh, if you have any questions, just jump right in, and uh, we also have two students in Seco Ranch who have not uh, come on the air this time, but uh, I'm sure they will. Boys will be boys, girls will be girls. Interesting gender stuff. Well, th this, as I was saying, for extra credit, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. If you run across an article, um, I pretty much read the paper every morning, the Houston Chronicle. I, I get that. New York Times on the Sunday to really get some news about what's really going on. But often if you just thumb through the 
front page of the <laughs> Houston paper, you'll find articles and things like that. Did we just have somebody come on the air? Can hey. you hear us now? Is that you, it's Amy? A Cinco Ranch. Yes, it's Amy. And Shauna? Yes, hi. Hi. Y'all look so <laughs> wonderful. Look at that. Do you play lacrosse, Shauna? Do I play what? Lacrosse? No, uh, no. Amy, is that your lacrosse shirt you have on there? Oh, it's a French shirt. No, I don't play. Oh, good. Y'all look lovely today. Yesterday you were a bit <laughs> hazy and black and white and off in the distance. And Y'all can sit down and start taking copious notes from my stimulating lecture. Okay, um, I have one little thing I need to tell you about. My okay. grandmother passed away last night, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be at the class on Tuesday because the funeral will be this weekend. It's in Illinois. I am so sorry. How sad. Had she been ill a long time? Yeah, she's had Alzheimer's for about four years, so... Well, I'm really sorry. Yeah, well, just, just do, take care of your personal business and jump back in with us when you can. Okay, I just wanted to make sure we'll that you We'll keep you did. in our thoughts and prayers, but thanks for sharing Thank that. Um, wow. Uh, okay, well, um, we are looking at this gender stuff, and I kind of want to look over some of the stuff we did, uh, kind of review of what we talked about the other day. Those of you that have me before, one of my philosophies of teaching in uh, epistemology as a way of knowing something is kind of from an analytical psychology model. Analytical being a Jungian model. Uh, kind of the great contribution of Carl Jung was giving us this concept of uh, the collective unconscious that all of us have within us everything that has ever existed in the human experience we all have within us. We'll probably look some more at that uh, on Tuesday when we look at archetypes and stuff. Um, but, but it's a way of knowing. It's a way of looking at things. It's, uh, it's not the only way. Scientific methodology, uh, uh, the Freudian method. Remember in Freud's method of uh, psychoanalytic, how was sex decided and gender decided? Remember some of his strange ideas that are often not accepted now as much? Uh, that what, what was the problem that a little boy had to come to terms with? Yeah, does anybody remember that? Yeah, put, punch a little button. Love of his mother. Yeah, yeah. He had that little Oedipus thing going where uh, he uh, felt competition between his father for the love of his mother, and he had to resolve that. And uh, his identity as a man was determined whether he could get that resolved. And, and finally, he has to grieve the loss that he won't have his mother for his own. Uh, and then he moves on to go find someone for himself. And it's interesting, you know, Freud gets a lot of hard press because he was said that sex is the motivation for everything. And it's interesting to realize that what Freud, as I understand, he, was, he tried to make the body or the soma as the definitive uh, aspect of defining what a human being is. And he said we must make the soma dogma in order to fight the occult. Took me a long time to figure out what he meant by that. He said, we must make the pleasure principle dogma in order to fight the occult. If you ever kind of, if that ever kind of sinks into your consciousness uh, over time, you're going to see that principle coming up over and over. For Freud, in defining what makes a human a human and how we function in our behaviors, uh, he, he was trying to say that that the body is always looking for its homeostatic balance. For example, if I have an itch, well, just scratching the itch was a way of bringing my body to its homeostatic place. Uh, I'm hungry this morning. I'm a big breakfast eater. Well, I eat breakfast, and it soothes my stomach, and my body's at rest. Or, or going to the bathroom when you, when you need to urinate, and that pressure, and, and so you go to the bathroom, and you put your body at homeostatic state. And that the pleasure principle is simply that the body's always trying to put itself in that place of pleasure where it's not experiencing pain or anxiety or some kind of discomfort. And having sexual urges and satisfying those urges, um, whether it be through snuggling, intercourse, kissing, touching, anything, that all of these are part of the pleasure principle being activated, uh, as is eating or scratching or... Uh, uh, you know, stretching like this, see, I'm trying to get my body is experiencing some, uh, it's out of its homeostatic balance, so I'm stretching, yawning, it's moving the lymph glands some, see, to get the body to that homeostatic uh, place. And, and he made that, he thought that in defining a human being in our behaviors, uh, psychological behaviors, acting out behaviors, whatever, 
that we must make that dogma. That means this is the truth in order to fight the occult. Now, what did he mean by that? What is the occult? John, Amy, and Shauna, just jump on in if you, wanna, if you have an answer to that. What is the occult that he felt like we were fighting against? We fight against our urges for sex and aggression? No, John. Thanks for jumping in. Nice job for jumping in, but I didn't have that in mind. What's the occult? Yes. Would it just be the requirements of culture to, be, to act a certain way? Okay, requirements of culture. Um, Kim? Yes, uh, occult means culture. Uh, uh, interesting, when you take the word culture, a culture is defined by certain schematic rules and uh, forms of behavior and dress and language. And you'd see a cult would be a little culture. And when you look at any grouping of people, any grouping would be a cult or a little subculture. Like there's a subculture of uh, teamsters, truck drivers. There's a culture of uh, teachers. Um, there's a subculture of what football players, a subculture of ballet dancers. I mean, you could just go on and on and on. And what are some of the subcultures in our religious world, denominations, uh, religious beliefs, uh, Islam, uh, Catholicism, Judaism, Hindu culture, the Buddhist culture. And these are all, uh, as it were, occult, cults. And, and I, don't, I don't mean that in a negative sense, but in a sense of a group of people Oh, historically define themselves as uh, they, they have a set of rules and ideas about what it means to be a human being. So when Freud is saying we must make the pleasure principle dogma to fight the power of the occult, what is he, what is he getting at? What is he getting at? What is he saying is the, I mean, what's the occult we must fight? The power of culture. Well, what would be an example of a culture or an idea from a group that could be negative to the human experience? Does anybody know what clitorectomies are? What are clitorectomies? It's like what female it? circumcision. Yeah, it's female circumcision that some cultures and, and religious uh, groups believe that's, that's a way to stop a woman or a young girl from having her sexual urges so she can submit uh, to God. And uh, Muslim, I think, means submission. Um, and you'll find a lot of this in chapter 2 of your book where it talks about the effect of religion on, on the world. Uh, in the early Jewish tradition, you know, the Ten Commandments, there's been stuff in the news about that recently. Um, Thou shalt not uh, commit adultery. Uh, if you read that commandment in Exodus a little further, it says, nor covet uh, a neighbor's uh, cattle or property. And a woman is just seen as property in that culture. She's just thrown in there with the cattle and the sheep and the uh, goats and whatever. And, and in that culture, a woman is seen as part of their property. And, and it's a very matriarchal culture. And a woman uh, didn't have... Um, rights to this as a person, and she had, was very, very restrained in her role. Uh, she could be owned by a man. Uh, who hasn't gone to a wedding when you step up to the front and the minister says what? Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Hello, McFly. <laughs> Let's think about that a minute. <laughs> who gives this woman to be married to this man? Do you hear the subtle power of the occult, the culture, that says this woman is the property of, it used to be, the, the father would say, I do. And then we've seen it evolve into, the father says what now? Her mother and I do. Oh, well, we've advanced. Now the young woman is not just belong to the father in, in the story, she belongs to the mother and father. And we give her to be married. Um, I have to say, my quite enlightened and aware daughter said, no way, Dad, you're not giving me away to anybody because I don't belong to anybody but myself. That cost me about uh, a lot of money to send her to New England and get all those ideas. And, uh, but but it, there's a lot of truth in that, see? 
if you start looking at the power of the occult. So what Freud was trying to say is we can come up with some real strange ideas on what it means to be a human being and what motivates us and what defines us as a person. Um, and so Freud said, well, let's just go back to the body. And let's say, let's try to bring the body to its pleasuring. Um, you know, any questions or comments? Amy, Shauna, do you have any questions about that? Or no. comment? Do you find that a little interesting? Say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that sounded very patronizing, didn't it? <laughs> Say yes. Pat you on the head. Um, well, so, uh, so uh, one way to uh, understand gender identity from the Freudian model was talking about this uh, resolution of the Electra complex, the girl, the little girl toward her father's issues. And if a girl, for example, doesn't resolve the issues that daddy's not for her, but daddy's for mommy, what will the little girl do uh, in her later life? What will she go in search of? Daddy. Yeah, another daddy, a father figure. And, of course, at, at a psychological sense, we are all sort of do this. Someone said that one of the purposes of marriage is to go back home. I'll be your mommy if you'll be my daddy. Looking over here, Emily, uh, I got her name right at least, in the, in the transactional uh, analysis model, <clears throat> we have this parent, adult, child, just to, just to sort of show how we can get stuck in some of these ways, uh, and, and we have this parent within us, and we have this nurturing parent, and this critical parent. Well, all of us have that. Nurturing is, uh, you know, for support and love and food, clothing and shelter. And critical, that's our little critiquer, shoulds, oughts, have to, supposed to. And then we have this, uh, uh, this rebellious child um, and this, uh, what's the word, rebellious and creative or playful. The spontaneous child, the, we have part of the child that rebel against all authority, we, and then we have this energetic, creative, playful child within us. And then this adult part of us, it's the part of us that says, I feel, I think, I am, I will, W-I-L-L. -L. And this, this would maybe be seen as our ego. The parent would be what? In the Freudian model, our super ego. And the child would be what? It, our instinctual side. Uh, in, using the Freudian model is our instinctual side and super ego. And the development of ego is what's so important in the first 14 years of life. I think when we get through this in the next uh, couple of classes, you're going to see how, how our gender identity is so tied to our ego formation. And the reason it's so hard to begin to think outside the box is because it really has to do with our existence in the, in the group, in the family. Um, okay, so what happens, this is transaction analysis, means you, you see it in, amongst transactions. So if you had someone who was, uh, for example, had a huge P and a little A and a little child, <laughs> this person would might be, what might you say about this person? They probably would have no fun, could not enjoy the lusts of the flesh, the joys of the human experience, and they probably couldn't make many decisions. They'd be just rerun by sort of pharisaical shoulds, oughts, have tos, supposed tos, right? <clears throat> now, what if you met someone like this who had a huge, rebellious child, very little adult, very little moral rules and boundaries? Well, someone like this is going to do what? end up in TDC? Because if you let your instinctual savage world out, you end up where the instinctual animals exist, and that's in the zoo. And have you ever noticed how a zoo and a prison look very much the same? Because you're not able to contain the instinct, which you have to do to live in society. So like a, uh, a lion, we put you in a zoo. So someone here would do that. Now here's what happens in the model of, for example, uh, relationships often is this is called a therapeutic marriage. In therapy, we see this all the time with couples that come in. 
parent, child, parent, child. This is called a therapeutic marriage. Unfortunately, most marriages kind of start out like this because, and it says, look, I'll take care of you, honey. <laughs> and if you'll take care of me. Wow, that'll work. I'll be your daddy and you be my mommy. I'll provide for you, if this is the male and the female here, I'll provide for you and do all the thinking. See, and then you can just play house. And if you'll do all the nurturing for me, mommy, see, then I can, you know, play and be irresponsible. And, see. and what, what's well, the thing that hasn't happened at this stage is we haven't developed our adult. This was probably more true when we're in our late teens. That's why if somebody's a teenager in a marriage, chances only one out of ten marriages last more than ten years if one person's a teen because they haven't developed their ego, their sense of adulthood, their I am, I think, I want. Um, and so much of what happens in therapy, you can imagine, is trying to get people to communicate adult to adult. I feel, I think, I want. And if, you can, if you're in a relationship with anyone that you can express your feelings, your thoughts, your ideas, and not have someone be defensive or angry, and vice versa, you're a very lucky person. See? I mean, because marriage is really for adults. It's not for children. It's for two people owning their own reality and expressing it with another and giving the other one the right to have their reality and express it with you and work through compromise and stuff. Well, as those of you who've been in my classes before, so I didn't necessarily, I wasn't planning on doing that, but it just came out. Any questions on this? Um, and so what may happen here is you could get fixated in a gender role, couldn't you? For example, if, you, if your job is to be the mother of yourself, your, spou your spouse, and your, your children, uh, the, over here, you may get fixed and I overly do a projective identification with being the nurturer. And if your role over here, for example, these are sort of traditional understandings, is to be the, uh, get stuck in a projective identification as the non-feeling, thinking, strong breadwinner, you can get stuck in that. And, you, and your whole gender will do that, and as we saw in the picture, you're going to run with the boys that play cowboys and Indians and pretty much say this is what a man is. Yeah, Michelle? Would Ford have said that if somebody never got over um, like their Oedipus complex right. that they would always look for that therapeutic marriage even as they got older? I think so. I, I, I can't speak for him. He's not here, of course. But uh, yeah, I think that's the whole point is that we have to come to terms with those childhood wounds, which we all have. And we might say that much of life is guided by those aspects, uh, those aspects in our, you know, our unconscious world. Say that wound that happened, and of course the three or five year old doesn't realize that that wound is there. So what happens is it drops down in here into the unconscious, and that Oedipal wound. Are you my mother? Remember the little Dr. Zeus book that the little chicken is running through the barnyard. You remember that? We read that to our kids. Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Those of us that are codependent and looking for nurturing, we're often doing that with people. Hi, will you help me, hold me, define me, tell me I'm okay? Uh, and see, and often that's a, it's a wound or something that lies in the unconscious that will affect so much of our life. Because remember, what runs our life is what we don't know about ourselves. What runs our life is what we don't know. That's why the urge to consciousness is so important. Because we are, our decisions, so many, I mean, our decisions in all of our life, to a large degree, are not based on the ego making its choices because it has understanding. It's mainly based on the, the unconscious reactions to childhood wounds uh, as the source. That's not meant to be, uh, that's meant to be, more, well, I guess it can be determinate. It's more, meant more to be definitive. But many of our problems in relating, our gender prejudices, our issues of dealing with our sexuality and our 
gender issues are all related to repressed issues uh, from our childhood to a large degree. So that, yes. Is it possible for somebody to ever completely know themselves then? No, I don't think so. To, but, how far can, but how far can you get? And how much is there left that you're never going to know? Uh, good question. Uh, how, how far do you, can you get and how much will you never know? The, the Buddhist tradition says is that if you reach this state of nirvana and wholeness uh, for three days in a row, then you will die because you've uh, achieved that place of wholeness and uh, you've arrived. Um, well, we, well it's, it's more of a theoretical thing. I think uh, it, it, the, the closer we get to it, actually, this is an interesting thing. We begin this journey, as T.S. Eliot said, and we, we take this path, I can't quote it, and we come back home and we know ourselves for the very first time. The interesting thing on this path to individuation is it becomes strangely familiar because you're really coming home to who you were meant to be in the beginning. See? And yet, it's unfamiliar because there's this adaptive personality that we built in order to get approval from parents, the occult, the caregivers around us. Um, but I don't think we arrive. I think, I think the journey is about being in process. And in fact, what I've discovered in my journey toward this individuation, um, trying to be an authentic person and be real and know myself, and other people that I've talked to, is actually you realize you're more screwed up the farther you go. You realize you're more split and you're more not your true self. And, and you realize that there is this split psyche or split soul. But in fact, realizing that is a sign of integration. Realizing that I'm not who I say I am is really a sign of having individuated. See? So it's like you, you realize you're more unwhole, but actually you are more whole. But we never get there. We never get there. Um, so some of the terms we talked about last week, and, and just to use this as a model, sort of the whole goal is this process of individuation, <clears throat> which means not divided. It means uh, becoming one's true self. It means, uh, well, I had some fun things written here. It's uh, individuation is self-knowledge. I guess I ought to make it bigger so you can see it. It has to do with self-acceptance. Uh, it has to do with integration. See, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process, a process of self-knowledge, self-acceptance, integration. Um, it's a... Uh, uh, it's coming to self-realization. Uh, it's, uh, it's coming to selfhood. Well, gee, I like art, and I like taking pictures, and I, I love the beauty of nature, and I'm still a man. I'm still very much a man, but I love beauty and sensitive things, and, and yet growing up I was told that that was for uh, weak men and girls, and, and, and it was too feminine to, to want to deal with the beauty and tenderness of life. See? Well, over time, this coming to self-realization is coming to the fact of going, wait a minute, I realize that this is myself, and it is okay, and I will not be defined by my uh, masculinity, femininity, based on something that somebody else told me, which we all were in those early years. And so we evolve into our own, uh, our own self. And this is, Jung said, this is, the, this is the task of the second half of life. And the second half could be a midlife crisis. It could be an early life crisis. I've met many people in their teenage years who are kind of going, uh, you know, I want to become who I am. And... Uh, begin that journey of self discovery And it can be a late life crisis. People in their 50s, 60s, 70s that finally wake up and say, you know, I've just been living my life out to someone else. I haven't been willing to follow an adventure toward this scary thing of, of uh, following the person inside. So to be a human is to unfold 
our uniqueness of our own individuality. And this is all kind of messy here, but so individuation is a process of becoming whole. Uh, that's what individuation this is a great test question. So, and then individuality is what? Anyone? Why do I feel like Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Anyone? Anyone? Uniqueness. Yeah, becoming unique. Someone once said that uh, God's gift to us, the mystery's gift to us, is our life. Our gift to the mystery is to become the unique person we were intended to be. Uh, but that's always easier said than done. Uh, it's, it's, to, uh, it, it's, to, it's to be the gift that we are, be the unique person, to be able to share your ideas, feelings, thoughts, uh, worldview, individuality. And then another term we looked at was individuality. Individualism. Now, what's that dastardly word? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. What did you say? No, individualism would be uh, self focused narcissism. Two R's, narciss. C-I-S-S-I-M. Self-focus. And individualism is viva yo. I can do what I want to do. I'll be running my own life. Thank you very much. Um, I don't need anybody, anybody else's help. See, individualism is the great bane of our culture in the sense that, see, because what it miss is this great, misses this great theme. I alone am responsible for becoming my true self and becoming a healthy human being. And, and integrating my own life and not projecting it on you. I alone am responsible for becoming me. But I can't become me without you. For I need your feedback. I need your critiquing. I need your love. I need your support. I need your marrowing. That you affirm and love and accept me. That you will give me information about when I'm out of bounds, inappropriate, not functioning well. So I alone must become me, but I can't become me without you. So individualism is self-focused narcissism. Individuality is becoming our own unique person. Individuation is this process of becoming a person. I think this stuff has so much to say about gender issues. Because if the goal in life, which I'm suggesting, and this is there may be many goals, but... I'm suggesting that, that a worthy goal is to become one's true self. In fact, that may be what all of life is about, is becoming oneself. Then we have to integrate all of the myriad aspects of my herbness. I've got to integrate the, all the vastness of the universe that lies within me. Um, I have to get in touch with my masculine, feminine, my maleness, femaleness, everything. Hi there. You are? Oh, wonderful. Welcome to the class. Your last name is what? Your first name is what? Malena. How do you spell that? M-A-L-A-I-N-A. M-A-L-A-I-N-A. That is a great name. I've never heard of that before. What does it mean? Beautiful child. Beautiful child. That is wonderful. That's great. Herb means... Uh, handsome, studly, suave, cool, and, conspicuous, <laughs> and conspicuously humble. I've been carrying that name most of my life. That was pretty funny, wasn't it, Amy? Uh, Shauna? Yes. Are you all asleep again? John, put your feet down. Are your feet propped up on that chair? John, North Harris County, I hear you snoring, John. John's not commenting. <laughs> John has left the room. Elvis has left the room. Okay. Um, so what, 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 I'm do, I'm, what I'm doing this is trying to set up something to see gender in a bigger context. Now, interesting, the word gender comes from the word gin. <laughs> gin, which means, what does gin mean? Does anybody know? Gin means to bear. It means to, uh, uh, to birth. Why did I have all these notes together before class and now they disappear? Um, uh, gen, gen, 
Gender comes from the word to bear or to birth. Uh, words like Genesis is the birth of the human race, for example. Uh, words like uh, genealogy. Uh, it really has to do with uh, to be born that way. So, uh, so we'd see uh, gender means to be born that way. <clears throat> Which is really kind of an interesting concept because it, it almost sounds uh, fatalistic, doesn't it? So there you were born and you have no choice now. Um, but that's where these words come from. Uh, ge gentleman, gen means somebody who's born with that trait. There's a real gentleman. See? Um, and let's see, what were some other words? I I can jump out with them. Okay, so uh, yeah, generosity. No idea. Gener generous person is someone. It's interesting. We don't say that was a generous act. We always say that was a generous person. We're saying someone who's born that way. That's good. Generous. It's an interesting word. I, I'm I'm a big philologist. Philologist. P H I L O. Phil, law, low, just. What's a philologist? Yeah, a lover of words. Words are powerful issues because when you pick out a word to share, that word's coming from the unconscious because where does it come from? It just, it's not there. You're not reading a script. You're sharing an unconscious script. Um, I remember uh, when I was talking to a client in my office one time and uh, he, he, she had just gone through a huge crisis, and she said, I just feel devastated. And I said, devastated? Wow. And I went and got my etymology book. <laughs> this was done in a therapeutic kind way. And we looked at, I looked up uh, devastation. It's a pretty phenomenal word. It has to do with de-vastness. De-vastness. You see, for a Bedouin warrior, Bedouin warrior walking across the desert, first people that figured out about all the astrology and the signs, and you know their their map for getting across the world is looking at the stars. Anybody who knows navigation or you know, there's a sextant or something, um, and so the the one constant in all of life was, see, because in the desert you didn't travel in the day; it was too hot. You traveled at night by moonlight, starlight, and there's Polaris up there, and you know where North is, and you could get where you wanted to go. But the word devastness would be to when the sun goes down and you look at the stars and the vastness is not where it's supposed to be. The stars are in a different place. Now, folks, if you ever look up and the stars are in a different place, uh, something catastrophic is getting ready to happen because this whole thing works on gravity and everything being in its place. So when someone said devastated, suddenly I thought, man, that's not just a hangnail, we're talking about a huge upheaval of one's life. Uh, so that, that's kind of how I got turned on to uh, looking at words and the meaning of words and uh, what they are. So uh, when we just today to look at what makes up a human being born that way, uh, I want to talk some about that so we can look at genetics and what's there. And a first aspect would be our genetic predisposition, our heredity, that makes us up, and um, just to throw some things out, that uh, everyone has a predetermined genetic uh, biological plan of development, don't we? What determines the sex of a, uh, of a child? There are how many chromosomes? 23 pairs of chromosomes, and all the chromosomes are actually, they're shaped sort of like that. And what is different about the 23rd chromosome? Yeah, if the 23rd chromosome is XX, what do you get? A girl, that's good. If the 23rd chromosome is XY, what do you get? A boy, good. And, uh, and that's a predetermined thing. You can't decide what's going to happen there or how that will happen. Um, so that's a genetic predisposition. See, this is the old, uh, when we look at uh, what makes up a human being, we look at the nature versus nurture. 
what we are born with, our genetics, our gender, our, sec our sex, which to a large degree is determined, is determined by something that's not our choice. What you'll find in the text, and all the texts say this, is basically our sex is, biolo is biologically determined, but our gender, to a large degree, is culturally determined. That seems to be the emphasis of the books. Uh, and as many things in life, there's, it's, you know, there's, the jury's still out on all of that. Uh, maybe in our DNA study, we're going to find more and more how our life is determined more by our genetic makeup. Um, but in our heredity, 93% of all human beings are right-handed. 7% are left-handed. When I was growing up in the early 50s in, in school, I, I remember a one girl who they actually tied her left hand behind her to make, force her to write right-handed. Because uh, remember, right is right and left is wrong. Any left-handers in here? You're left -handed. Have you ever experienced any prejudice about that? Probably not. They didn't know how to teach you how to write? Yeah, or you end up in classes where the desk goes the wrong way, and, uh, or maybe it goes the right way. <laughs> it's wrong for you. Um, but, but, for example, uh, right-handedness is, uh, is uh, ingra firmly ingrained by seven or eight years old for a child. Now, see, what's really interesting, if you want to become a whole person, you always have to work on your least developed side. So the left-handed person that's forced to work on the right hand is sort of an abuse at one level, but at another level actually forces the other side of the brain to work. That's why a lot of times if you're, if you'd write, if you're journal, if you try to journal with your non-dominant hand, you'd be amazing is at the level of emotion and feeling you'll get to. Because you'll find that your non-dominant hand shows how so much of your life is undeveloped so much of your psychological life is undeveloped. Um, uh, studies of Hopi Indians done that infants uh, begin to walk at about 15 months whether they were swaddled or, and cradled or whether they were allowed to walk, crawl. Apparently there's a predetermined genetic uh, template that you're going to walk at about 15 months, 14 months, uh, 12 months regardless. It's because they took uh, these infants in the 1940s study and they actually just put them down and they took off walking and they'd never crawled. See? So apparently that's a hereditary thing, a genetic thing. And then the classic one of toilet training where they did a pair of twins and at about those who were trained to use the toilet and then those who weren't trained at about 23 months, everybody's using the toilet. So it didn't seem to be a function of training as it did of... Uh, something within the child that pushes us uh, to get there. And things like our motor development, some are slower uh, in one area than the other, some are tortoises, some are hares. Uh, our eat, drink, sleep, wake patterns of children tends to be all a predetermined um, aspect. Our, our neural development in children often is uh, some, some children have a flat brain wave at birth. I think some teenagers seem to have a flat brain wave. Uh, and, then, uh, and then some children have a very active brain wave. And this doesn't mean anything necessarily. But things like uh, IQ and uh, our gifts, our talents, many of these things are determined uh, by our heredity. Eye color, body structure, skin tone, rate of growth, voice tone, our creative gifts, many of those are all in the genetic predisposition. Our matur mat maturational process is often determined. This is all determined. Uh, fr frequently, uh, even when uh, I meet students that come in for counseling with their, their parents, bring them in, you know, the, say the student is uh, four, 13 years old. Well, to say someone is 13 tells me very little about someone. It, I can probably guess they're seventh, eighth grade, maybe thirteens, eighth grade. Uh, but I've seen some thirteen-year-olds that are that look like they're twenty-three, twenty years old, very developed physically. Guys that are shaving, um, young young women, thirteen-year-old women who are very shapely and developed in their hormonal structure and stuff. And then I've seen some thirteen-year-olds look like they're nine years old. 
I've met some 13 year olds that are very sophisticated in their, or their skills, social skills, verbal skills, look you in the eye, express what they feel. Uh, and then I've met uh, some um, 13 year olds who are very uh, not developed in their ability to relate. Uh, and their physical prowess or lack of it. And their intellectual prowess. There's some 13 year olds that are way out in front of some 40 year olds, believe it or not. There's some 13-year-olds that are very slow to catch on to their development. And I frequently encourage parents, you know, just you know, don't freak. Let this process develop. You know, don't, don't uh, make judgments because somebody's not going at the norm. For in fact, there is not a norm. We develop at our own rate. Okay, well, along with this genetic thing, one of the things that uh, the, I found in one of the texts that I think is important to look at is there's really four major levels of uh, four levels of biological sex, um, four biological levels of sex. I actually I I, I wasn't in the red group on writing, so um, but most of this you can read pretty well. Okay. And first is genetic sex, sort of what I've been talking about. It's uh, when the sperm enters the egg at the moment of conception, there's a genetic map that will lead to the development of further expressions of maleness, femaleness, and intersexuality. So that our sexuality to a large degree is determined by this, the blending of the chromosomes and hormonal things in when... Uh, soon as the uh, sperm enters the egg. Uh, next one is called um, gonadal sex, G-O-N-A-D-A-L. has to do with our gonads, or our uh, ovaries for women and testes for men. And this, uh, our gonadal, I guess it's called, um, leads to the development of our um, sexual organs within individual bodies and the hormones that they produce or do not produce have an effect on our sexual development. So it's genetic predisposition and then uh, forgot the D, didn't I? See, some of you, my other students, been in my class before, you know, sometimes it's spelling, see. And, when I miss that, you can, and then another one is body sex. This was actually done by uh, someone named Hunter. He did some studies in '95, and then Zucker. Two different studies that were done on noting sexual development expressions of our biological sex, and body sex is uh, the hormones are present or lacking, and during development will partly determine what sort of internal and external sex organs become apparent in the individual. Body sex is the anatomical structures with which a person is born will then play a major role in how they are categorized and how the individual feels about himself or herself or him herself. So uh, our sexuality to a large degree is determined by our body and how it kind of turns out. And then the fourth one is called brain sex. Sounds kind of kinky, doesn't it? Brain sex. Uh, and this is how the brain may be sexually differentiated is one of the most intriguing questions facing sexologists today. There is growing evidence that hormonal influence exerted by the gonads on the brain before and after birth plays some role in determining our male type or female type behaviors. Uh, is the, the, the effect of these things. Uh, so these biological levels of sex do not consider the more complex psychological, sociological, cultural aspects, but it's simply looking at the issues that do affect our sexuality and our gender uh, based on uh, the fertilized egg and how that lives itself out over time. Um, and with this, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of... Uh, show you something that's just very, very interesting to me um, in looking at this. To 
You see, we all begin conception as um, we are conceived as what? Does anybody know what we're all conceived as? Well, we're all conceived as females. Um, I'm going to come back to some of the chromosome things here, but this is an interesting thing. Um, and uh, Emily, will this come up on the screen? Can you draw it in closer? Oh, Emily, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, let's just do that top one right here. Thank you so much. Now, the, the uh, let, let me just point this out, and y'all can write this down. The first one is the Wolfian system, or the Wolfian duck, W-O-L-F-F-I-A-N, Wolfian system. Just write that little puppy down, Wolfian, by someone named Wolf that learned this. And then the, the Wolfian system. See that? That's what that is. If you can't read it, I'm going to spell it for you. And then this one down here is the um, Muller Mulleranian system. This is M U L L E R I A N system. M U L L E R I A N. Now, th this says here at six weeks, it's really at a month, five weeks, all human fetuses have the antecedents of both maleness and femaleness and uh, uh, reproductive ducts. And the, the Wolfian system uh, noted here under the male, under the influence of testicular testosterone, the Wolfian system develops and the Mulranian, which is the female system, uh, its inhibiting substance causes the Mulranian system to degenerate. And then the Mulranian system, which is noted by this part right here under the female, with the absence of testosterone, the Mulranian system develops into a female reproductive ducts, and the Wolfian system fails to develop. Now, for an analytical psychologist like me, who believes that the, who really honors both the androgyny of people psychologically, this is just fascinating. For the fact is, is that all of us have male and female possibilities of, uh, in those first month of, uh, after uh, creation takes place. And uh, just le leave, your, leave the camera right there and I'll slide this down. And see, so what happens in when uh, the presence of testosterone I'll do it here, is such that after about six weeks, the fetus, if testosterone is excreted, what it does is it gets rid of this, the propensity to be a female, and actually these gonads, which are both present, see, see how these pictures are identically the same? There's the, the gonads and the, uh, I mean the uh, testicles and the ovaries, basically come from the same place. And when the Wolfian system is present and testosterone is secreted because it's that Y chromosome, look what happens. Is what happens is, here's the vas deferens and the testicle, here's the scrotum, penis develops. And that begins to happen at, at six weeks for the male develops. And then the female, if the testosterone is not present, something tells the chemical makeup of the child, there's no testosterone here, there's no Y chromosome, therefore we're bailing out of the, this is not a male, this is gonna be a female. And so those developing ovaries, remember which were the same thing as the developing testicles, those gonads that were there, what happens is, the male Wolfian system disappears. And as we'll go down here, we see that the ovaries develop, the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the upper part of the vagina. Does anybody find that kind of interesting? Isn't that interesting? 
that we're more similar than different. I mean, we're conceived the same. And then, uh, I don't have the study, but I've always heard that there's only 3% of the male and female bodies that are different. Now, those differences are profound, obviously. Uh, but that 90% 97% of us is the same. And then, just for purposes of following up on this, um, you'll see how the undifferentiated male and female internal sex organs at six weeks and after conception. Uh, see, it's very similar. And then the male penis and the woman with the clitoris. And you see how there's an evolution of the... See, he, here it is at six weeks. It, they're both the same. And then the presence of testosterone causes the the female Mullerian to disappear and the Wolfian develops, so a man develops his penis and a woman. See, see how similar they are and yet they're evolving differently? And then we see the sex organs that are quite different. But yet, see it came from the same uh, biological uh, start as it were. Now, now I, I, think, I think what uh, it's to sort of use biology as a metaphor is pretty exciting to say that although our biology is different, our origin is the same. And the thing we really fight over culturally is not being willing to own that we all have all of us within us. And that if I do not develop my feminine psychological side, I'm going to have a problem with the feminine as I experience it in the world. If I don't develop my masculine side, I'm going to have a problem with the masculine as I experience it in the outer world. Uh, any questions on any of that? Shauna, Amy, John? No questions? No questions. No questions. Do you find it sort of interesting? Very. Very. That's a good response. Uh, wh uh, here it is. What do you find interesting about it? They were all the same in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. See, that, that's interesting to say we're all conceived as female. Well, actually, we are all conceived as both male and female. But then, according to whatever happens with the testosterone, we go one way or the other. Now, I as you all know this, I'm sure there's, uh, according to the chromosomes, uh, let me just get rid of that. Um, According to our chromosome makeup, um, there's anomalies or abnormal behaviors that occur, and abnormal is not bad, it's just different. But there's what's called the, um, uh, the K-L-I-E-N, Kleinfelter. You'll see this in your textbook. Have you seen it? Did y'all see it in the textbook? And this would be someone who has a an extra female chromosome. This would be male genitals but with female secondary characteristics. Penis, scrotum, testes are small and large breasts. So this would be a male, uh, this would be a male but because of a, uh, uh, and actually two out of a thousand males uh, have this, which seems like a large number to me. Uh, and they have male external uh, genitalia, but often they can't produce sperm. Uh, they develop breasts, uh, female-shaped bodies, uh, increased chance of mental retardation. Uh, they've also found in another, uh, I don't know if it's a form of the Kleinfelter syndrome or not. Let me see if I have it. No, this is a, uh, this is actually a, well, I, I won't tell you that, but, but th this would be interesting to know for a, a test question. But, but they, they also, for example, if a male may have this, may have two male chromosomes and one female chromosome, and this would be the super male, the aggressive personality. 
where this person has the appearance of being a normal male. They tend to be tall in stature. may show some lack of control over impulsive behaviors, usually average intelligent levels. And there were some studies done several times thinking that people in prison actually uh, possibly had too much aggression because they had an abnormality in their chromosomal makeup. And the studies basically show that's not true with that. Didn't they do that on serial killers? Uh, yes. Did they? Have you read a study on that? Yes. I, we, in my um, biology class, it said that serial killers, like some of them do have this XYY super male thing. Okay. She said serial. I don't know if it has to do with just general, general population in jail, but I know that serial killers do possess this. Have that. And is that, uh, Amy, is that you? Yes. Okay. And see, that's a great extra credit thing for you to do. Because you, you, you brought that up, and you might look it up on the Internet or find an article on it and then write a little bit about that. And see, that would be extra credit kind of stuff. Because you already have some information about it, you're interested in that or something. That would be an example of extra credit that would show you have initiative and you're further developing the topic we're talking about. But that, that's very interesting. And then the other one is called the Turner Syndrome for Women. And the Turner, Turner syndrome is the presence of a female chromosome but no male chromosome. Uh, or there's only, there's no Y chromosome, excuse me, there's only one X. And these uh, females have uh, female e external genitals, ovaries are often, there's no ovaries. They lack menstruation, pubic hair, and breast development. There's uh, uh, some, uh, a woman who's born without that, uh, with, with no other X or Y chromosome, just one X chromosome, has stunted growth, severe, uh, several body abnormalities, a sense of direction, and spatial relationships may be abnormal. So lacking ovaries, lack of menstruation, pubic hair, breast hair development would be the Turner syndrome. And these are just sort of abnormalities in chromosome development. Um, and often this causes sterility in a woman because she has a chromosome that's missing. She appears female but doesn't develop female internal organs. Uh, without ovaries, there's no estrogen. And there are other forms of this. Uh, for example, just to th throw this out, you know, a woman can have XXX chromosomes. Um, these women often can suffer from retardation or other uh, or marginal intelligence. There's people have, have this. Say it again. If you have Turner syndrome, does that have an effect on your brain too, since you don't have any estrogen? Um, because up in number four on the studies done by uh, Hunter, yeah. he said that brain sex was based on behaviors because of the um, hormones. So if you don't have any estrogen, wouldn't that have to be a problem? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things uh, that it says here is that you'll uh, have problems with spatial relationships and sense of direction. Now, we can probably all laugh about that because we're always, it's sort of one of the battle of the sexes is about directions and where we're going. But no, apparently it does, that lack of estrogen does affect the brain. Um, that. And uh, up with the men, too, there's uh, some of the other abnormalities can be, uh, well, no, I already did that one. But there, there's other ways that things can turn. There may be a, a, a true, a maphrodite is one who has XXX. Why? The variable may some combination of both ovarian and testicular tissues uh, usually have uterus, but uh, external genitals may be distinctly masculine or feminine. Um, at puberty, most experience breast enlargement, a majority menstruate. Interesting, I've been previewing probably 20 videos for this class, only to find out that I can't show the videos in class because this is on public TV and you have to have rights. In my regular classes, I like to show videos, and, uh, but I'm trying to get the rights to show this stuff. I'm faxing people who make the videos to get permission. And there's one real interesting um, 
video done in England uh, that shows a woman who was born with this, uh, I think she had Turner syndrome, it wasn't Turner syndrome, it was some uh, anomaly of her chromosomes and a uh, very, very interesting woman, a very, you know, uh, she married and uh, she wasn't able to have children but she became a PhD in something and was interviewed. It's just very interesting. What, what, what the whole purpose of showing this, obviously, and since we're trying to become enlightened about gender issues, is to realize that none of us genetically come out the same way. And so many of our prejudices toward people, ooh, they're this or they're that or, you know, they're macho or, you know, there's a feminazi, et cetera, et cetera, all these kind of colloquial terms we throw out with people, we don't realize that people, we all come to this world with certain genetic predisposition. And, and having a culture that so rigidly defines masculine and feminine, we don't give space for people to be unique. This is the great bane of our culture, isn't it? We don't accept and honor the uniqueness of people. And we push for extremes. This is called the maximalist view of gender. All women should be this. All men should be this. See? And if you're a real man, you should have these traits and behaviors and looks. And if you're a real woman, you should have these traits, behaviors, and looks. And... Uh, in many ways, that behavior is nonsensical. It's quite unfair uh, because we're not honoring that there is a genetic predisposition uh, that needs to be honored and looked at. Okay, let me. Uh, so did that. Let me. We just got uh, four or five minutes left, but let me throw in a couple more things. Uh, and one is this: is uh, this is somewhat genetics. Uh, and, and this is also a genetic, but I make it as a different one for purpose of teaching is our personality traits and they're also givens aren't they and personality traits is you know some people are extroverted some introverted some are cautious some risking this is this is uh, what makes us a human being you know what's a human in our uniqueness and um, is uh, genetics and with that, those are variables with there and our personality traits we have as many variables there some are active some passive some are relaxed some tense uh, some are more trusting some are more suspicious so a lot of these traits are not necessarily related to childhood development some of them are just our just the way we are uh, the timid versus venturesome personality and the uh, serious versus happy-go-lucky Years ago, I was uh, working, counseling a family, a wonderful couple who just were going through a midlife divorce. It's, so many times there are no enemies. It's just things don't work out, and they, they maybe are meant to move on or people not ready to do work. And they had three daughters, and the daughters were like 11, 9, and 6. And the parents asked me to see each of the daughters to see how they were handling mom and dad splitting up, which I was glad to do. And the uh, a nine-year-old, we actually went down in my building, got an ice cream cone, and we were talking, and she was licking the ice cream cone. She, just, she goes, Dr. Egan, you're not like the other therapist. And uh, maybe she didn't get an ice cream cone there. And I said, well, you know, after we talked to me, I said, you know, you're, I'm gonna, your mom's going to want to know wh how you're doing. And what do you want me to tell her? You know, because, you know, the sadness and the change. And uh, she said, and, and her mother was quite extroverted, sort of a bubbly cheerleader kind of hyperactive person. And uh, was that funny? Did y'all like that? I like your description. Well, yeah, well, you know. I had some other words, but I couldn't throw out because we are on the air. And the <laughs> chancellor may be watching, I was told. So uh, anyway, uh, so this bubbly mom and, and this daughter and, and the nine-year-old, she says, well, doctor, again, I wish you'd tell my mom that just because I'm quiet doesn't mean anything's wrong with me. And I thought, wow, is that not perceptive? Of course, she was like her father, who's very in, in, uh, quiet and introverted. And uh, uh, so we have this, this other aspect of genetics, our personality traits. And uh, uh, another one, too, is uh, personal choice. You know, that we have this volitional will on who we are and how we function. Uh, another one is... Uh, Mystery, that what makes us who we are is a total mystery. We'll look at some of this uh, next time as we're in our last minute of our class today. And then, and then another one, of course, is environment. V-I-R-O-N-M-E-N-T. Uh, environment has to do with parents, 
culture, media, um, and uh, you know the air we breathe, all that kind of stuff. And the point, what's interesting about this is how so much of this is done by nature, and then things are done by nurturing. And to understand a human being, the essence is honoring both sides, nature and nurturing. So this week, I just want you to be aware of some of your issues around men, women, boys, girls, your own gender issues. Look at that. Have a good weekend. And we'll get back here next week and uh, have another class. Thank you. Bye.